conservative new media viewers, LA Lakers fans around the world, Jeremy Lin fans around the world. What is up? It's me, PFV, Paul F. Villarreal, the NBA expert, and we're here to talk about in the long video format the Lakers 104 to 87 beat down loss tonight at home in Staples Center, Los Angeles, California, against the New Orleans Pelicans. The Pelicans came into this game at 8-10 and 10 on the season, and they were on a four-game road losing streak. They had also played in Los Angeles last night and were defeated by the Los Angeles Clippers. So, coming into this game, things looked fairly bright for the Lakers. They looked promising. And one of the things that looked like it might be able to help tonight at least if you're just a, a neutral Lakers observer, is that Byron Scott was making lineup changes. He took Jeremy Lin out of the starting lineup and placed him with Ronnie Price, and he took Carlos Boozer out of the starting lineup and replaced him with Ed Davis. Now, I'm just looking over this, the pregame notes really quickly. Byron Scott was asked what Lin and Boozer needed to do in order to be able to get back into the rotation or maybe become starters again. And I am reading from somebody's tweet, and I don't know who it is. The quote is, the biggest thing is I need them to defend offensively, especially from Jeremy, understanding just what a point guard is. He still has to learn that, unquote. So that's part of what was going on in the, the build up to tonight's game. And also something else that came out, and I don't know if it came out before or after the game, I guess the Lakers were granted a hardship exception. I believe that will be, I don't know if that's a roster spot or, or if it's money or contract money available to be able to pursue another player because I would imagine that's for Xavier Henry. I think they've already gotten one for Julius Randle and one for Steve Nash. So that might be a third one for Xavier Henry. I didn't get the chance to actually read the article because he suffered a, a torn Achilles tendon, unfortunately. Okay, so again, heading into this game, it looked like Lakers off the road trip. Let's go home. Let's make the lineup a little bit more defensive-oriented. That's, that's the thinking of Byron Scott. And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Unfortunately, it didn't work out well for the Lakers, and it particularly didn't work out well from the offensive end. The Lakers, in the first three quarters of this game, had scored only 59 points. So they were averaging a little bit less than 20 points per quarter. You simply, you're not going to be able to win a game playing that type of offense, particularly when your defense is as poor as the Lakers is. The Lakers came into this game with the worst-ranked defense in the league, and it was about five to six points per 100 possessions worse than the Mike D'Antoni defense of last year. And, of course, Lakers fans will remember how bad that defense was. So if you score... 20 points per quarter, you have no chance of beating almost any team in the league with the Lakers' defense. You simply cannot do that. And so this is something that we argued about on different places over the internet today and once we learned about this, this lineup change. What I tried to tell people was, okay, based on advanced statistics, Ronnie Price is a slightly better defender than Jeremy Lin is. Not substantially better, slightly better. However, Jeremy Lin is significantly better on offense than Ronnie Price is. So, if you put Ronnie Price on the floor for Jeremy, you might get a little bit better defense, but your, your offense is going to fall off. And that's part of what happened tonight. Now, to be fair to the lineup, and this was mentioned during the game by sideline reporter Mike Trudell, the new offense, the new lineup for the starters doesn't have a lot of chemistry yet because they haven't played a bunch together. However, 
I noticed during this game that there were times where Ronnie Price was passing up shots. And I think it's because he came into this game shooting only 32% from the field. And I want to say his three-point percentage was like 28%. So the defense isn't going to be afraid of that. They don't have to play up on Ronnie Price until he shows them he can make a shot. He did make a three-pointer early in the game, but I think that's the only basket he scored in the entire game. So I saw during the contest Drew Holiday sagging off of him, basically leaving Ronnie to kind of soft double-team other players because he wasn't concerned about Ronnie at all. So it sounds good to want to augment or strengthen the defense But if you're doing it at the expense of the offense, then you can end up with outcomes like this, in my opinion. Now, again, I'll be fair. It's just one game. And I like Ronnie Price. I have nothing against Ronnie. This isn't a personal thing about Ronnie, nor is it a personal thing about Ed Davis. It's just I made the analogy in the, in the well, maybe not in the short video, but in the earlier video today of Jeremy Lin being benched, that it feels like Byron Scott might be rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And that analogy means doing something that's meaningless. Because the Titanic's going to sink one way or the other. So you can rearrange the deck chairs, but the team's still not going to be any good. Right. So if that's the case, if the team is not going to be any good, then what do you do? Do you develop younger talent like Jeremy Lin or do you go with a veteran like Ronnie Price for whatever reason? And to be fair to Byron, I think he apparently somebody told me this. Thomas told me this right before I made this video that Byron Scott says he's going to stay with this starting lineup for 15 to 20 games. Okay. He wants to evaluate it, see how it works. That's, that's fair. That's fair. However, at some point, the Lakers are just simply going to be mathematically eliminated from the playoff chase. Truthfully, they're already eliminated. They're, 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 they're not good enough. The West is too competitive. It's I, There's a chance, but it's so slim that it's, it's extremely remote. At some point in the season, when it's clear that the team cannot challenge for the final playoff sp- spot, then I think the team's going to need to think more seriously about about examining and developing the younger talent, like Jeremy, like Jordan Clarkson, etc. But this is what Byron wants to do. This is his plan, and we're just going to have to deal with it. And I don't know if it's going to have any effect. As I said, I don't know if, if... Rearranging the deck chairs is going to matter very much. Tonight, it certainly didn't matter. And uh, I don't know if it's going to matter much at all in a lot of these games. Of course, the Lakers will have winnable games, like against Utah or against Detroit, some of the other teams from the East. But a lot of the games, they're they're going to be the underdog. They were the underdog tonight coming into this game, even though they're at home. The Pelicans are playing on a back-to-back. The Pelicans are missing one of their starters, Eric Gordon. The Lakers are still the underdog. So it is what it is. Um, uh, If you're a Jeremy Lin fan, just hang in there. He's been through this before. He was not happy about the demotion, which he said after the game. He said he was disappointed. He's not. He's not going to do Omer Ashik on the Rockets last year and pout and sit out and miss 20 games, basically, to pout. So that's not going to happen because he's not like that. But he's not happy, understandable. Just let it play out. If you're a Lynn fan, that would be my advice to you. I mean, play it out tonight. It didn't look real good. 
for the lineup change. And that was mentioned during the broadcast. Uh, basically, Bill McDonald, who's the play-by-play man for Time Warner Cable Sportsnet, said, yeah, it didn't look like the lineup change did much, and uh, it didn't do much. So that's that's the kind of the overview on the, the coaching situation and the lineup change situation. The overview of the game was New Orleans got off to a fast start. They were up six points after one quarter. They were up 10 points at halftime. And then this kind of came out and hammered the Lakers in the third quarter. The Lakers have had trouble in the third quarter the entire year, and they had trouble tonight. And by the time we got to the end of the third quarter, the Lakers were down by 20 points. And that was about it. The Lakers won the fourth quarter. The bench went on a 12 to nothing run early in the fourth and got the game down to like I don't know, like 12 points or something again. And, and then the bench kind of faded away. Pelicans reasserted, and it was just extended garbage time for the rest of the game. So that was pretty much what took place in this game overall. In terms of Jeremy from an overall, he didn't play that great in this game. Actually, no, I take that back. He played okay. He didn't shoot well in this game. He was only one of five from the field, and I'll go over the statistics in a second. Other than that, he played fairly well. His defense could have been a little bit sharper, but it wasn't that bad. And the players who were going against him didn't do that great. So it's even if his defense wasn't as tight as maybe it could have been, the opponent didn't do a whole bunch of scoring against him. So if you're a Lynn fan, then that's kind of the overall for him. And he's got to adjust to this bench roll thing. That's that's not his thing, and he hasn't been used to that. So, Okay, quickly going over stats, and then we'll go over some selected quarter by quarter and kind of wrap things up. Anthony Davis, 23.6 rebounds to lead the Pelicans. Drew Holiday, Point guard for the Pelicans, 22 points, 4 rebounds, 8 assists, 3 turnovers. So he had almost a 3-1 to turnover, assist to turnover ratio, which is fantastic. 9 of 17 shooting, which is over 50%, including 4 of 5 from 3-point range. No free throw attempts. He was a plus 19, which was the best on either team. Moving to the Lakers, one, two, three, they had six players in double figure scoring, led by Kobe Bryant, 14 points on six of 18 shooting, four assists, three turnovers. Ed Davis, 12 points, seven rebounds. He had, he, he did well as a starter. And the biggest thing for Ed, if you're a fan of his or the Lakers, he didn't have any personal fouls. Usually Ed Davis is a foul machine. That's one of the biggest problems or limitations for him as a player. Not tonight. So very happy for Ed. He played great. Uh, he, he really he really did well in this game. Wesley Johnson, 10 points, 3 assists. Jordan Hill, 8.7 boards. Ronnie Price, 3 points, 1 rebound, 3 assists. Ronnie played 26 minutes, shot 1 of 4 from the field, including 1 of 2 from 3-point range. No free throw attempts. 2 steals. One block, no turnovers, plus minus was a a minus eight. Bench, Nick Young, 13 points, but it took him 13 shots to get it. That's not that good. Carlos Boozer, 12 points, but it took him 12 shots to get that. Jeremy Lin, uh, excuse me, Wayne Ellington, 10 points. Jeremy Lin, three points, 20 minutes played, one of five shooting, so only three points on five shots. That's not efficient. Zero of one three-pointers, one of three free-throw attempts, three rebounds, four assists, no steals, no blocks, one turnover, three personal fouls, plus minus was a minus nine. So the truth is, is that Ronnie and Jeremy had relatively similar stat lines tonight. Ronnie had better defensive stats than Jeremy did, two steals and a block. Jeremy had one more assist. Jeremy had one more turnover. They both had excellent. I mean, Ronnie was three to zero assisted turnovers, and Jeremy was four to one, which is fantastic. So I thought they played pretty well, both of them. And I'll talk more about that. I mean, relatively speaking, 
they they played actually I should say they played similar. I shouldn't say they played well. Ronnie had his hands full with Drew Holiday though. Now, to be fair to Ronnie, a decent amount of the scoring that Drew Holiday did wasn't directly against Ronnie. It was on pick and rolls, transition, switches, this type of thing. He did have a couple of buckets against Ronnie directly. He also had maybe two or three buckets against Jeremy directly. But he just didn't – the defense wasn't bothering him a whole bunch, whether it was Ronnie or Jeremy or anybody. So uh, he played well. Just got to give him credit for that. So uh, he was – a for the majority of this game, he was the leading scorer for the Pelicans. I think Anthony Davis overtook him at the very, very end or very close to the end. So uh, he was uh, he was an important part of what they did. Okay, let's go over some selected quarter by quarter. And I'll just add some more thoughts there at, at, at the end here. Um, Ed Davis had a nice block or a really good challenge on a play early. Drew Holiday beat Ronnie off the dribble. And Ed Davis was right there to help him out. And that's what the big men need to do. And the truth is the Lakers need better big men. They need more athletic, younger, better jumping big men like Ed Davis. And not only does it help on defense, it helps on offense. Because those are the type of players that can run pick and roll with Jeremy and finish pick and roll players with dunks rather than layups underneath the rim, maybe like a Carlos Boozer. So uh, Ed's got a long way to go to progress as a player. He's pretty raw, but he's very athletic, and he's a willing defender. He also has a good – he's a good pick-and-roll player. He has a good feel for how to run the pick-and-roll play properly. Okay, later on then, I I like the way that Ronnie was moving the ball on offense. One thing I will say in defense of Ronnie is the ball is in and out of his hands quick. And that's what Byron Scott wants. And Byron Scott's offensive system, he doesn't want a lot of dribbling unless the ball maybe get going into the post like to Kobe for an ISO isolation play where he's backing his man down. Byron wants the ball to move around the perimeter. And I think in general, Ronnie is better about that than Jeremy is. So I want to say that to be fair to Ronnie. And it is something Jeremy needs to work on in this offense. It's it's tough because Jeremy, a big part of what makes him him is his scoring ability. So he, you need to, for him to be maximized, you must have the threat of the scoring. Because that's what that's what sets up a lot of his passing. But in this offense, that's not what the point guard is is designed to do. So when Myron Scott says that he wants Jeremy to have more point guard instincts, he means point guard instincts in his system. Now, if Jeremy was playing like the Russell Westbrook role or another score first point guard or in a score first or score a lot point guard system, then the point guard instincts would be a lot different. But in Byron Scott's system, it's not quite like that. It's almost more of like a Derek Fisher role. Or it's not it's not Houston's role. It's it's kind of similar, but it's not quite that. It's not just stand in the corner or whatever, but it's you gotta move the ball and be really decisive with your actions rather than pound the dribble on the perimeter. That's that's just what Byron wants him to do, and that's this system. And as I've said before, the more systems you can experience and master, the better you will become as a player. So Jeremy's not really comfortable with this system. This is not a Mike D'Antoni pick-and-roll system. But he can continue to get better at it, and I'm sure that he will. And, and that will help him in his career overall. Okay. Um, then the announcer said late in the first quarter that Jeremy has not finished the last 
couple of games. Of course, we know he didn't finish in the Boston game, and he didn't play at all in the fourth quarter. So they brought that up, and they were basically saying that Ronnie Price has been Byron Scott's preferred guard to finish right now. And it's, like I said, look, Byron's experimenting with stuff. The team, as I mentioned, is on a, a path for the worst season in 67-year history of the Lakers by winning percentage. But Byron's got to try everything. No matter what anybody says, somebody was trying to argue about this with me on uh, Real GM. Sure, the Lakers don't expect they're going to be a great team this year. That's that's fair. I agree with that. However, a big part of why Mike D'Antoni was fired or, or actually was not extended on his contract, and so Mike then decided to quit and walk away, in my opinion, was that last year was epically bad, Hor- horrendous. From the Lakers' perspective, you don't have a lot of seasons like that. I mean, there's almost no seasons like that in the franchise's history. I think the team lost 20, I think they won 27 games, like 27 and 55 or something like that. Well, the current team is on pace to win like, I don't know, like 20, 21. So you're talking a whole, even a higher level of failure. So I know that the team would probably, in the best scenario, like to keep their top five pick and perhaps not do so great, but you still don't want to fail you don't want to be you don't want to be the coach of the worst season in the Lakers history no matter what anybody says nobody's trying to do that and if you watched the the introductory press conference of Byron Scott and you heard kind of it was it's not going to be like Mike D'Antoni and we're going to focus on defense you have the worst defense in the league this isn't going really well and certainly they've had injuries Steve Nash Xavier Henry Julius Randle, but this is this is like a train wreck. The train is heading towards the wreck, and so I think Byron Scott's trying to trying to change the tracks. He's trying to divert train to another another route. I I don't know if he can do it or not. Like I said I don't know if you can stop the Titanic from sinking. We're gonna find out, I guess, but. Uh, it's going to be difficult. Not only are the Lakers not great, the West is really, really great overall. The top teams are incredibly good. There's something like, there's like six or seven teams in the West right now that are on pace to win 60 games. That's ridiculous. Now, it won't stay that way, but it's massive imbalance. And the Lakers have to play all these teams multiple times. So it's it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a struggle. Um. And, and what I will say with that, with Lynn fans, is just understand. There's a, uh, first. Let me say this: There's a lot of people that think the Lakers are trying to tank. They're trying to not do well this season. Some people think they're calling it stealth tanking, meaning they're 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 pretending they're not tanking, but they're really trying to tank. So it, it's possible. I don't know. I'm not I'm not in the heads of Jim Buss and Mitch Kupchak and Jeannie Buss and Byron Scott, etc. So but whatever moves are made, whatever coaching decisions are made, keep that in mind. The stealth tanking theory. Also keep in mind Byron Scott does not want to have the worst record in Lakers history. So he's just got to do anything he can. He's just trying to throw mud on the wall and see what sticks. I wouldn't, Don't take it personally, in other words. Things might come around still for Jeremy. But it just, Byron's, I think, I personally feel Byron's getting desperate. The defense is the worst in the league, and the team is not good. And it's on a path to be historically not good. So... If it were me, I'd try everything. And I think that's what's starting to happen for Byron Scott is he's starting to try anything and everything. Okay, then 
Drew Holiday had a nice little scoring move over Jeremy's. It was kind of a tough defensive play. But then right after Drew Holiday scored on Jeremy, Jeremy came right back down the court, drove right past Drew Holiday, was fouled by Drew Holiday, and scored a layup. So we've talked before about this thing of getting getting your get back. And that was definitely an example of that. And it was nice to see Jeremy do it. That was terrific. Then Jeremy boxed out, which means to get position to rebound against the center for the Pelicans. It was a a hilarious play. Like he almost looked like almost like he was trying to take the legs out of Alex Ajinsa. I think that's how you say his name, but he wasn't. I'm glad they didn't call a foul on it, and he was able to get the rebound away from Ajinsa. So that was a really nice play. Then Jeremy missed his first shot of the game right before the end of the first quarter. It was kind of like a free throw line jumper from the right side that just uh, just didn't go in. So we hit it in the second quarter, and because Jeremy came in late in the first quarter, he stayed on the court then at the beginning of the second quarter, which is the typical rotation for the bench players. Okay, then he had uh, a couple different blown assists early in the second. He also had his first assist to Carlos Boozer for a made jump shot. And then he had a nice defensive play against backup Pelican point guard Gal Meckel. He basically, Gal Meckel drove to his left, tried to put up a layup, but Jeremy took the angle away from him. And so it basically was a really bad brick off of the, uh, off of the backboard. Okay, then moving on into the middle of the second quarter, Jeremy probably had his best play of the game, along with that and one layup that he scored against Drew Holiday earlier. He dribbled going right to left along the baseline. So he was basically on the left-hand side of the baseline, right right in like a post-up position, except closer along the baseline. He then found a cutting Ed Davis with a behind-his-back bounce pass to Ed Davis for a monster dunk. That was a phenomenal play. Might have been the Lakers' best play of the game, actually. Uh, Nice chemistry there between those two players, which they've demonstrated numerous times in the preseason and the regular season as well. Then Jeremy had a very nice head fake. He up-faked Anthony Davis, got Davis up into the air. Then Jeremy went into a shot motion, so Anthony Davis fouled him. And he was given two free throws, which he missed both of them, which is a rare thing for Jeremy. He came into the game shooting like 85%, but just couldn't get it done there. Now, the announcers then said they're not sure how long the new lineup will last. And then they mentioned that Jeremy in Houston had lost his job and that this was kind of a similar situation, of course, referencing Patrick Beverly. Uh, I do think Byron Scott said after the game, and I believe I mentioned it already, that apparently he will let this new starting lineup play 15 to 20 games and then evaluate from there. And the announcer said that the second unit for the Lakers was playing well, and it, and it was. They were, they were doing better. And there is something to be said for letting... Jeremy have the ball more himself rather than having to share it with Kobe when they're both playing in the starting lineup. Now, when he's playing in the second unit, he's going to share the ball somewhat with Nick Young. So there's still an issue there, but many Lakers observers have called for Jeremy to to play off the bench, not because he deserves it, but because... It would give him more chances to handle the ball and create plays without Kobe on the floor then. Then Jeremy went out of the game for Ronnie Price with six minutes left in the second quarter. The score was then 37-28 to New Orleans, and it was with about six minutes left. So Byron Scott likes set rotations, and what that means is he is a coach that 
will put players in and out oftentimes based upon the time left in a quarter rather than what the score is at the at the time or how a player is doing some coaches are not like this Mikhail was less like this Mikhail is I refer to him as hot stock cold stock if you're playing well he'll keep you in oftentimes whereas the other coaches like Brian Scott when it is your time to come out he's going to take you out regardless of whether you're playing well or not that's what we saw in the Boston game Jeremy had played particularly well near the end of the first half and I think going on early into the third quarter. But when it was his time to come out, Byron took him out rather than riding the hot hand. So this is just the, the, the type of coach that he is, his style. Then uh, Ronnie was in and soon thereafter, Drew Holiday hit a three-point shot off of a pick-and-roll play. So again, this is not that wasn't Ronnie's fault or it wasn't all his fault. Sure, when the pick is set on you, you have to fight through it, but I thought that Ronnie should have received more help on that particular play than what he ended up with. Then Ronnie was having some nice defense. He played good defense late in the second quarter against Drew and basically ended up creating a New Orleans Pelicans turnover, so that was nice. Um, then there was a, a funny play... Ronnie was guarding Drew Holiday, and he Drew Holiday stopped dribbling, and Ronnie and the other Lakers were anticipating that Drew was going to pass the ball, and so what happened was Ronnie and like maybe two other Lakers, they all ran away from Drew Holiday to go and try to prevent him from being able to pass to someone else. So they went to guard the men that were going to maybe receive the pass. And so Drew was left all by himself, and he took one step towards the hoop and just, I think he shot a short little jumper. So that was that was a challenging stretch there for that moment for the, uh, for the Lakers defense. And then I made a note that says Ronnie's moving the ball well. And as I said, he does do that well. He also has nice assist numbers per 36 minutes with low turnovers. So we got to give him credit for what he does do well. He will move the ball well. He will play aggressive defense. He's good at getting steals. So he has value. Again, I like Ronnie. Ronnie, Ronnie's a good player where he's – he has his strengths. Let's put it that way. And – You could see that tonight. Okay, moving on to the third quarter. Again, the Lakers were down 10 points at the half. I believe the score was 50 to 40. So the Lakers were only on pace to score 80 points, which no matter how good your defense is, as I said, that's not enough. That's that's almost never going to be enough in an NBA game, particularly when you have a defense like the Lakers. Then... um. I made a note that says it looks like Ronnie is afraid to shoot the ball. And what happened was, is he was passing up open shots and that becomes, or it's what it looked like to me anyway, that's really can hurt an offense because if the defenders don't have to respect your shot, then basically they can go and double team someone else. They can just do what you'll see is the when a man receives the ball on offense and he's not a good shooter, the defender will just they, they're basically daring him to shoot. They want him to shoot because they know he doesn't shoot well. So it's like they're not giving him any respect by getting up close to them on defense. And that's how Drew Holiday was playing Ronnie at this point in the game. And Ronnie looked like he didn't want to take a shot. He looked like he wasn't confident in his own shot. And so it was allowing Drew Holiday to almost play like like a roaming defender. He was able to go and double team other guys quicker because he was already leaving Ronnie. And so 
as an offensive player, this is why you'll see guys that are not good shooters, but when they get the ball and they're wide open, they shoot. If you don't shoot, then it's it's easier for the defense. So you must shoot just to keep the defense honest and respect your your respect you as an offensive player. If not, it just becomes much easier for the defense to do their job. So I thought that Ronnie might have been hurting the offense a little bit there because it didn't look like he was taking open shots. Then um, then Drew Holiday scored again against Ronnie. He did another pick and roll. Ronnie got kind of caught up in the pick, and he just got a short little jumper, I believe. So he really wasn't Ronnie had a nice couple plays against him, but overall, I don't think that that Drew was having a hard time really against Ronnie or Jeremy, to be honest with you. So it's that's just kind of the way it looked like it was working out. Although he did, Ronnie did have a nice play on defense against Drew on the next sequence or two. Okay, then I put a note, and this is the middle of the third quarter, Drew Holiday helping off of Ronnie because he knows Ronnie won't shoot. So this is what I'm talking about. You can't overpass. If the ball comes to you and you have a shot, you have to take it. Or you at least have to take it sometimes. And Ronnie wasn't taking it any time. And I think what Ronnie did is he came out and shot a couple shots early. He hit his first one or two, maybe the, the first or the second one he took, which was a three-pointer in the left corner. And then I think he took another couple and he missed them and he didn't shoot again. So... It's, like I said, that's kind of what the pattern was. Um, he then, Ronnie had a really nice play on help defense. Luke Babbitt drove around Kobe, I think, going to Luke's left, and he drove towards the middle of the, of the paint. Ronnie stepped over, poked the ball away from Luke while he was driving in, and it ended up to be a Pelicans turnover. So that was a very nice play by Ronnie. Okay, then they showed Sylvester Stallone. He was there with a couple of his kids, it looked like. And then they showed Iggy Azalea, who was the girlfriend of Nick Young, of course. So they're kind of doing the celebrity camera uh, search thing. Then Jeremy came into the game. This is late in the third quarter for Ronnie. I didn't have it exactly marked down when he came in. It was the last four minutes of the quarter. Then... He drew a foul against Drew Holiday, but uh, there were no shots on the foul. He was, was not going for a shot. He then forced Drew to miss a shot, so that was a nice defensive play by, by Jeremy. Then Jeremy missed a layup around the rim. I, I, I didn't see the play. I just I was writing notes, and I heard the, the announcer say it, so I did not see it, actually, so I can't really say it. Then Jeremy made a really nice play and this is something that we've talked about before this came i believe the score was 72 to 57 new orleans jeremy had dribbled the ball down the court setting up the offense and he was roughly standing on the top of the key maybe about 10 degrees left of the top of the arc excuse me not the top of the key the top of the arc top of the three-point arc and this was one of these situations where he had stopped dribbling and he had to pass the ball, and he almost passed it, and it would have been a turnover. But instead of doing it, he waited. This is good progress. And we talked about this a game or two ago, and I was upset with the Washington game. I was upset with the turnovers because it looked like he was rushing and panicking. Well, he looked He looked to his right, and he was just about to make the pass. The defender came up if he would have thrown it it would have definitely been a turnover and a layup but he, he held the ball took his time and avoided the turnover i was so happy to see that that was just it was just a great play good awareness by jeremy I and mean, he's progressing at this again uh he had just one turnover tonight in 20 minutes so that's definitely going to help his turnover statistics and uh, I was just really happy to see him make that play. Then, um, yeah, this was a horrible defensive play by the Lakers, the whole team. I, 
Uh, let me just make sure I have the man's name correct. Dante Cunningham got the ball on basically like the left free throw line extended. He was a little bit to the right of the free throw line and a little bit above it. So kind of like the right top of the key extended if you drew a horizontal line from the top of the key. I don't know who was guarding him. I'm not sure who it was. He drove right past that guy, and he went right down the middle of the lane for a two-hand dunk. So he beat his man, and nobody helped in 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 the inside of the defense. It was ridiculous. The announcers, it's just like, I mean, it's, you can't get worse defense than that. So that was that was a little bit demoralizing to see. Then. Um, Jeremy had a difficult situation where he, Drew Holiday scored a three-pointer against him. New Orleans was coming down in transition. Jeremy had picked up another man. He had picked up someone else's man. And that man passed the ball back to Drew Holiday, who was sitting up at it. The man Jeremy was guarding was about, was almost in the right corner on the three-point line. Drew Holiday had set up about 40 degrees right of the top of the arc. The guy passed it to, to Drew Holiday, and Jeremy tried to run at him, but it was way too late. So no other Laker had come to help Jeremy. Basically, Jeremy was trying to guard two people. And Drew, Drew Holiday just kind of sat there for about two seconds and sized it up and hit the three-pointer. So more difficult defense for the Lakers on that one. Then Jeremy, right before the buzzer, missed a three-pointer, which I also did not see. It was like a buzzer beater, I think. The Lakers were then, right before the end of the third quarter, they were booed. The fans were not happy. The team was down by 20 points or so, and the fans were booing them to let them know about it. Then, heading into the fourth quarter, Jeremy was still on the court which is then the normal rotation for the bench, come in late in the third, stay in early for the fourth. Then I put Jeremy is moving the ball well. So he was doing the quick passing on the perimeter, which again is, is what Byron Scott's offense is designed to do. So I thought he was doing a good job of, of doing it there. Then he had an assist to Wayne Ellington, pardon me, for a made jump shot. Then he had a nice play where a screen was set, a pick was set for Gal Meckle, uh, I think for a jump shot. Jeremy fought over the screen, got up, challenged the shot, and it was a, a miss by Gal Meckle, so that was a nice play. Now the Lakers made their run with the bench. They essentially then went on a 12 to nothing run, and they got the lead from, they were down 22 points and they cut it down to 12 points I believe unfortunately then Jeremy he missed a shot high off the glass he went in for a layup and he wasn't able to convert it and now the Pelicans started to push the lead back out again so it looked like the Lakers had a chance they were pulling closer then the Pelicans started to kind of push them back away heading into the middle of the fourth he had a really nice play where he saved the ball. It was about to go out of bounds. And I'd say about seven of the players on the court stopped playing because they thought it was going to go out of bounds. Jeremy dove along the, the, the end line, uh, the Pelican side of the court. He saved the ball, and it led to, I believe, Wayne Ellington and Nick Young getting a fast break in which Nick Young was fouled. And he got free throw. So that was a terrific play but that was made by Jeremy getting that save. He then had his first turnover of the game and his only turnover of the game. Drew Holiday scored a basket against Jeremy. And then Jeremy was coming back down looking to get his payback. And he just kind of, I think he just lost handle. He lost his dribble. I think he was trying to decide, is he going to shoot? Is he going to pass? And it's kind of like like a little bit of overthinking there, and the ball just got away from him. So it was just, just a simple mistake. But again, it's hard to be mad if you have only one turnover in a game and the team has only seven turnovers 
and you have four assist. So it was just it was just a mistake. It was just one of those plays. And then he fouled the man right after that. Like the ball went to New Orleans. They were about to run a fast break. And so Jeremy wisely fouled the man to prevent the fast break. And you could see him kind of put his head down because he, he was mad with himself. He was frustrated because he made that play and, you know, the team wasn't winning and et cetera. Then um, he had his fourth assist and final assist of the game. Passed the ball to Carlos Boozer for a made jump shot that came with around five minutes left in the game. Soon after that, Jeremy was subbed out of the game, and it was now the – it was four starters plus Nick Young. So I believe Wes Johnson was not in the game at that time, I, I think. I think that's what it was. And then right after that, because the game was – again, the game was going away from – the Lakers at this point. This is when Bill McDonald said, yeah, it didn't look like the lineup change, change in the starting lineup made much difference, and it did not. It, it In this instance, it didn't make a bunch of difference, but we, well, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it'll make more difference in the next game. Anthony Davis then got a huge alley-oop dunk, uh, uh, lob pass to him kind of over Ed Davis, and Anthony Davis is just such an incredible athlete with great time, and it was it was really a, a pretty play, although it's not so pretty if you're a Lakers fan. Then Ronnie Price got a nice steal against Drew Holiday. He went down the other end of the court, and then Drew Holiday was able to block his shot on a layup attempt, and that was about it. Kobe came out of the game with two minutes and eight seconds left. Jordan Clarkson got into the game. It was nice to see him get a little bit of playing time, even though it wasn't much. But the game was completely out of hand at that point. I believe the Pelicans were up 18, and they would go on to win by 17 points. So, wrapping up here, just to restate what happened. Pelicans seized control, up by 10 at halftime, up by 20 at the end of the third quarter. Lakers were booed at the end of the third quarter, and they were booed at the end of the fourth quarter as well, which I did not mention before. So they were booed in the last, like, I don't know, five seconds of the game. Fans wanted to let them know they weren't happy with it, with what happened tonight. So it was just a tough outing. The lineup change did not have much effect. Uh, Ed Davis played well. Ronnie played okay, but he wasn't really able to slow down Drew Holiday much at all. Drew had a very good game. Anthony Davis had a good game, which is not to be unexpected against anybody. Kobe struggled with his shot. He shot just 33% from the field. He did have 14 points to lead the team. Kobe is now 62 points away, I believe, from tying Michael Jordan. So that's probably maybe three to four games, four games maximum, I would imagine that he's going to pass Michael Jordan. So that, of course, is a big event that many Lakers fans and many fans of Kobe are, are waiting to participate in and, and celebrate. When that happens, Kobe will be the third all-time leading scorer in NBA history, behind Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Carl Malone. Um, again, in terms of Jeremy, a solid night, but a shot was off, including his free throw shooting. His defense could have been a little bit better, although he, he, he competed hard, just could have been a little tighter. Overall, he, he played fairly well trying to adjust to this new role. And I, that's about it. There's not a tremendous amount more to say about it. We will have to see how the lineup change works out. I just over time, I mean, it sounds like it's going to be happening for a while. Now, the next game is coming up two days from now on Tuesday, December 9th against the Sacramento Kings. That is a winnable game, and the reason I say that is because starting King center DeMarcus Cousins is out with a viral infection, which is pretty serious. It's viral meningitis, which is no joke uh, from my understanding, and i Definitely think he'll be out for that game. So that certainly makes Sacramento a much more beatable team. That game will take place 
in Los Angeles Staples Center, and it will be on NBA TV. It will be at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday, December 9th, 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 11.30 a.m. on Wednesday, December 10th in the Philippines, Taiwan, and China. We hope everybody in the Philippines is doing okay with the typhoon down there. I've talked to a few people there. Bo was experiencing super high winds, but it, they were he was not in the direct path of the storm. I hope Tracy, Jelly, Cecile, everybody else is okay. We're all thinking about you, praying for you, and I just hope everything's okay for the nation down there of the Philippines. Um, so onwards, we move on to the next game. And as a Jeremy Lin observer, Jeremy Lin fan, Jeremy has improved this year. There's no question. And he's playing in his fourth offensive system in five years and his fourth coach in five years. So there's a lot of adjustments to be made. I think Jeremy's done an a good job overall. He's clearly progressed, in my opinion. He's progressed in the mental aspect of the game in terms of how he emotionally deals with with situations like benchings or whatever. He's progressed in terms of not getting, doesn't get as burned out when the team loses, which is good. He's becoming more confident. He's getting becoming a better offensive player. He continues to work at his defense. He likes the city of Los Angeles and the area. He's back in California, which is where he's from. So I, I don't like him being benched, but I'm content with his overall progress. I'm still confident about him. I think he's moving forward in his career. So I'm not going to let Byron Scott or anything else get me all shaken up. I still think Jeremy is on the overall path that he needs to be on. And as we've said before, if he does not want to stay with the team after this season, he does not have to. He will be a free agent. His contract will be up at the end of this season. So if he wants to leave, he can leave. So he's in. He's still in a good position. He's not happy with He's disappointed with, with being sent to the bench, which is understandable. You wouldn't want somebody who wasn't disappointed. Tonight wasn't his best game, but he didn't play a lot, and he didn't get a lot of shots. So, but I thought that he played the role that Byron Scott wants his point guard to play, which is a little bit limiting of Jeremy's abilities, but that's what the coach wants, so you try to do it. And I thought he did a good job. He had four assists and only five shots, and he could have had more assists. He had at least three blown assists in this game. So he, he was definitely looking to pass, and he controlled his turnovers. That's what that's what Byron wants him to do, so I thought he did a pretty good job of executing that. Okay, that is it. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Your comments below. We want to take the time to thank Gary Chen, artist and blogger from Taiwan who made the artwork that you're looking at right now. Gary is a member of the Jeremy Only Lynn Garden fan group. And you can learn more about Gary in the video description below the video player. We'll have a, a, information for his Facebook and you can go check him out and talk with him or be a fan. And we certainly appreciate him and all the people in the Jeremy Only Lynn Garden fan group. They're just tremendous people. They've helped us out a ton over the years in doing these videos and other things for, for the Jeremy Lynn global fan community. We'll also have a link so you can check out highlights of this game in the video description, as well as information about how you can come and follow us on Twitter and how you can come and join the Conservative New Media Facebook group if you would like to do that as well. Once again, I am PFE Paula Villarreal, the NBA expert. Thanks a lot for watching Conservative New Media. We strive to be the number one Jeremy Lin YouTube fan channel. It happened. Jeremy got benched. 
the world moves on and it's okay. And I think Jeremy is in a he's in a spot in his maturity and his career where he can deal with this. Even if it's not fair, even if it's not the optimum position and it's annoying and it seems like why does this always happen with him? But I think I think he's going to be able to continue to improve and progress in the way that he wants to and it, in a way that's going to be able to be positive for his career development. So I just encourage people to stay optimistic, stay positive. And other people are showtime and other people are telling me um, on Twitter, don't be negative, don't. Don't rip other Lakers players and stuff. And that's true. We, we should try to be positive. I know a lot of people are unhappy about Byron Scott. I understand it. As I said, I think Byron's desperate. I think Byron is desperate to get some wins. And he doesn't he doesn't want to be the, the person that has the worst season in Lakers history. So he's just trying whatever he can try. And I think that's that's what we're seeing right now. Similar to Kevin McHale, and unlike somebody like Mike D'Antoni, Byron Scott is a coach who his baseline of what he looks for is defense and rebounding. So if nothing is working, he's going to try to rely on those things. And I think that's part of the reason why he made the lineup switches. Carlos Boozer, not the greatest defender. His energy isn't what it used to be. Okay, he sits. Jeremy solid defender, much better than what he's regarded as. But maybe Ronnie's a little bit better. So maybe Jeremy's taking a couple shots away from Kobe or not moving the ball as quickly as I want. So, okay, we'll put Ronnie in. That's, that's what I think it is. It doesn't have to be a, a devious plot. It's just a guy that came in following a really bad year for the franchise last year. And he's trying to avoid having a worse year. And he's kind of struggling to figure it out right now. I think that's what we're seeing. So let's just keep moving on and uh, be positive. Support Jeremy. If you're religious, you can say prayers for Jeremy. And and uh, I know he's got the prayer group. So that's it. I'm just I'm looking forward to Tuesday. And hopefully the team can put up a better performance. And similarly for Jeremy. So have a great night, a great day, wherever you are around the world when you check out this video. Take care. We will talk to you soon. And again, if you're in the Philippines, please take precautions. We hope that everything is okay and that you guys will be safe and this typhoon will pass on as quickly as it can. It is 2 a.m. here early on Monday, December 8th, 2014 which means it is Monday, 3 p.m. in Taipei, Taiwan. That's it. Talk to you again soon.